We're back here on the AUA Inside Track podcast. The current global outbreak of COVID-19 is making a significant impact on healthcare delivery in the United States. As the American College of Surgeons and others urge postponing elective procedures, clinicians are looking for ways to minimize disruption of day-to-day patient care in their urology clinics. Telehealth and telemedicine are emerging as possible options for urologists. I'm joined today by Dr. Jonathan Rubenstein, chair of the AUA's Coding and Reimbursement Committee, and we're going to be discussing an important aspect of telemedicine, and of course, that is payment. Dr. Rubenstein, I do want to ask what is new with Medicare coverage with telehealth services during this COVID-19 pandemic? So there have been a lot of updates with using telehealth for Medicare patients recently. And this is something that continues to evolve and continues to change and may again change. But let's get to the basics. Billing established patient visits for Medicare was restricted that the patient must be in an originating site in a health shortage area for traditional Medicare. However, because of this coronavirus situation, Medicare came out and they no longer will demand that the patient is in an originating site or that the patient is in a health shortage area. What that means is patients can get telehealth visits in their own home instead of an originating site and can be in any location, just not a health shortage area. However, it did still say that patients must be established patients to the provider. So that's good because that really opens up the ability to perform telemedicine visits to Medicare patients from the comfort of their own home. When looking even deeper into this, Medicare did say that if in emergency situations that a copay needs to be waived to perform these visits, it's okay to do so. I would just document that into the patient's chart. It did mention that people can get telehealth visits through smartphone applications such as FaceTime or Skype, and that the Medi- Medicare would not prosecute providers for HIPAA violations. Now, on a quick side note, I have my own personal concerns about that, because although you may not be persecuted by the government, I would check with your own legal department before providing telehealth visits through uh, programs such as FaceTime or Skype, because you can be accused of HIPAA violations outside of the government, and that is be my concern. Medicare also stated that you do not have to prove that the patient has an established relationship with the provider, although I'm still confused a little bit about how to code for that if you still use established patient visits. So we're still waiting to hear back about that. So as of right now, uh, we can now provide telehealth services to Medicare patients in their home uh, without being in a health shortage area and without an originating site restriction. Another thing which I'll mention is that private insurers seem to be also changing their policies nearly every day. So it's really important that you check with your own state's rules for telehealth visits, but also for all your local insurers. I've seen some of them who allow phone visits, uh, some of them that will allow visits that they normally would not have provided, and for a certain period of time that they're now allowing telehealth visits where they did not in the past. So please check with your state and your local insurers for their updated rules and regulations. And again, these things may change on a day-to-day basis. There are obviously a lot of burning questions out there right now at this time. And I'm going to ask you about how practices can ensure they are being reimbursed for providing these services to patients. What are some of the top things that members need to keep front of mind in terms of payment policy? The most important thing is to check with your individual insurer, uh, individual Medicare provider, also to make sure that they have policies in place that allow for reimbursement of telemedicine services. While the majority of private insurers, especially with this coronavirus outbreak, either already had their policies in place or will be loosening their policies, it really comes down to the individual insurance provider itself to determine whether they're going to reimburse or not. For example, a lot of our private insurers uh, in uh, where I live had already had policies in place that have either been present for years or at least beginning in January of 2020, uh, although some did not. 
So before providing any telemedicine service to any patient, we wanted to make sure and check their benefits first. Obviously, Medicare has different rules and regulations than private insurers, but the only way that we could be assured of getting paid for the services we were providing was to check our EOBs and make sure that we were getting paid after the fact. But we only started providing telehealth services to patients where we believed that they had benefits based upon our insurance contracts. So let's talk about Medicare. Tell us about the virtual check-in G-codes, CPT, and HCPCS HCPCS and how they could and should be used by practitioners. So the first most important thing is Medicare has its own set of rules and regulations that have been in place for years where you really either had to be in a health shortage area and patients had to be in an originating site such as a hospital setting or similar setting to get paid for telehealth services. They also had, uh, there's also other codes that exist, including uh, online portal check-ins and telephone patient check-ins, which can use uh, codes G2010, G2012, G2061 through G2063, and 99421 through 99423. And these each had their own rules and regulations that surrounded them when those codes were being used. So telehealth services in general, you would code as you would any regular outpatient service using CPT codes 99211 through 99215 for an established patient visit and 99202 through 99205 for a new patient visit. Medicare was allowing established patient visits in patients in a health or in a shortage area uh, and in an originating site for our regular codes. Let's use, for example, G2012, which is a brief check-in. The brief check-in is a patient-initiated code where the patient wants to check in with their provider to see if an office visit is necessary or not. It's important that this is not provider-initiated, but rather patient-initiated, where they can pick up the phone and call and speak to their provider to see if a visit is necessary or not. This has to be more than seven days from a previous visit, cannot be just a follow-up from a previous visit, nor lead to a visit within seven days or the next available appointment. So there are a lot of rules and regulations that go around using G2012. Since the coronavirus outbreak, there's been an increased interest in using G2012, but again, the same rules need to be followed. It has to be patient-initiated. It cannot be in direct relationship to a previous visit, and it cannot lead to another visit within the next seven days or the uh, provider's next available appointment. If all those uh, points are met and criteria are met, then the provider can bill G2012. G2010 is a similar code, except this is not a real time, but rather is more of a store and forward, and then the, the uh, provider can review the information at another time. CPT code 99421 through 99423 is for an online evaluation through a patient portal for an established patient visit. And it's worth seven days, whatever you do within seven days, um, you can bill it once, whether you spend five to 10 minutes, 11 to 20 minutes, or more than 21 minutes will determine the code that you then submit for reimbursement. And G2061 through G2063 are basically the same codes, but that's a qualified health professional who's a non-physician who provides the same online services to a patient. With the coronavirus outbreak and more patients wanting to get services provided from, I would say, the safety of their home rather than coming to the office, these codes uh, will be used more frequently. However, it's really important to understand what the codes say and the rules and regulations that are around it. Make sure it's documented in the chart before trying to submit for reimbursement. So can you tell me how telehealth services for Medicare are different than virtual check-in codes? If you're talking about a true telehealth service, let's say it's an audio-visual service that's being provided where a patient may log in through their portal, through their online computer program with the provider, and you get a service. Just as you would face-to-face, the only difference is there's a distance and you're doing it with audio and visual rather than face-to-face audio-visual. So it's important for regular telehealth services that you have both the audio and visual aspects that are both being provided 
just as you would if the patient was in your office itself. Again, you use the same E&M codes, 99211 through 99215, 99202-99205, depending on the service you're providing. The difference between that and a brief check-in, again, which we use classically G2012, is where a patient initiates a phone call to a provider to see if a visit is necessary. If the issue can be handled on the phone, it's not require an in-person visit or even a telehealth visit, the true telehealth visit, then the G2012 can be used at that point when it's documented appropriately. How does telehealth access differ for Medicare Advantage enrollees? For Medicare Advantage, again, you would really need to go and look at the individual provider and their rules and regulations. Most of the Medicare Advantage plans will follow regular Medicare uh, guidelines. Uh, But once again, uh, you use the same codes, but you have to check with your individual provider to make sure that they are following uh, Medicare's guidelines and Medicare's rules and regulations. What about private payers? So private payers really can do whatever they want to do. And again, a lot of private payers had already been allowing for telehealth services to be reimbursed, but it varies plan to plan and state to state. There's some states with parity laws where telehealth services must be provided and must be reimbursed similarly to an, in, uh, to an in-person visit. But again, the private insurers can choose to do whatever they want to do. They can follow Medicare guidelines. They can follow their own guidelines. Um, sometimes, whether based upon the state they're in, uh, they may be forced or recommended to uh, provide certain services based upon the state they're providing services. But again, it's really um, up to the individual private insurance company to determine what their own rules and regulations are, what the documentation requirements are, and what codes they use. So during the this COVID emergency, we've seen a number of insurance companies who have loosened their rules and regulations individually and some that have kept with their previous policies from before. So it's really important to check the individual policy in the individual state where you're residing and you're providing the services to make sure that you're getting reimbursed for the services you're providing. Do you have any tips from your own practices use of telehealth strategies? You know, we started our telehealth program uh, some time ago, and really it, the first is the computer work and making sure that you have a program that is compliant with HIPAA rules and regulations. We make sure the patient has appropriate consent so they understand the limitations of telehealth because obviously there's different things that can be provided for a face-to-face visit rather than a telehealth visit. For example, the ability to do a physical examination. And so as long as patients can sign the consent and understand the limitations of telehealth, then we allow a telehealth visit to be provided. We still have uh, the same check-in process where we get their uh, demographics, we ensure that their insurance is up to date, we collect appropriate co-pays, um, they sign the consent, and then we allow the telehealth service to uh, proceed forward. Uh, again, we do our best to double-check with each insurance company prior to providing those telehealth services to know in advance which patients certainly will have a denial Uh, who do not provide telehealth services, and ones that we most likely will get reimbursed for providing the appropriate services to those patients. And I just want to ask if you have anything else that listeners should keep in mind when billing for telehealth services before we wrap up today's talk. It's really important to get patient consent. It's really important to check with not only within your own state, the individual insurance itself. There are certain insurances, private insurances especially, that have uh, sort of a self-funded plan that even though the parent company may allow telehealth services, the actual self-funded section may not allow uh, telehealth services, and you may not realize that until some point down the road. We typically keep a list of which insurance companies we are getting reimbursed for and which ones we are not. Overall, my thought is and my recommendation is to think about the global aspect of bringing patients into your office because especially people who are at most risk Uh, of coronavirus. Not only might they decide not to come into an office setting, but we want to be able to to provide those medical services to them anyways. So for someone who does not want to come into the office, we'd like to be able to offer them telehealth services as an alternative, as long as they understand the limitations 
of providing telehealth services, that it's there are going to be some limitations compared to a face-to-face visit. We had, prior to this coronavirus issue, attempted only to provide telehealth services to patients that did not need a physical examination. If during the course of a telehealth visit, you realize that the patient is best served by seeing them face-to-face or they do need an examination, it's important for medical legal reasons to advise them to be seen for an actual physical examination, whether it's coming to the office, coming to an emergency room, coming to an urgent care center. Um, you have to protect yourself from claims of malpractice or lawsuits because there are limitations to providing telehealth services. Dr. Jonathan Rubenstein has been our guest today on the AUA Inside Track podcast, and he is chair of the AUA's Coding and Reimbursement Committee. Thank you, Dr. Rubenstein. Thanks, Casey. Have a nice afternoon.